we have to explain to the team why their quota is increasing. It has to be like, yes, your quota is going from a 3X to a 4X, here's why. We've invested in additional product, additional marketing, additional enablement, and because of that, our customer acquisition cost is going up. And because of that, we commissions are often pay, often one of the highest things that you pay out on a deal, um, you know, behind maybe marketing or, or what, and support, but the commissions are one of the highest things, individual rep commissions. And so those gradually inch down as you as you grow as well. I was in sales for six years and never had anyone explain that to me the way you just did. I'm Devin Reed. And I'm Sheena Badani. And you're watching Reveal, the revenue intelligence podcast powered by Gong. Keep watching here to see the full interview. Or if you like to listen to podcasts on the go, check out the links in the description below. And if you like what you hear, subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify or all of them, why not? And while you're there, make sure to leave us a five-star review. We personally read every single one, and I think I speak for both of us when I say they mean the world to us. Could not agree more, Devin. Now, without further ado, here's the episode you've been waiting for. Graham, thanks for hanging out with me on Reveal. I'm looking forward to our session because today we're gonna cover all things sales comp and commissions something that we have not talked about yet on the show in our two and a half year stint. So I'm really looking forward to it. Yeah, likewise, I'm excited. So I want to dive straight into it because you told me that you have helped build, and I'm gonna make sure I get this number right, over 400 sales comp plans. And so the first thing that jumps out to me is like, surely you've seen some things go wrong. I know you've got a story for me a little bit later, but like, <laughs> What do you see as the most common mistakes teams make when creating and rolling out a new sales comp plan? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, that's right. I've done uh, uh, over 400 consults where I help sales leaders, RevOps leaders, finance folks, whoever it is who's building the compensation plan, help them think about and build their compensation plans um, and the rollout thereof, which is, you had said, mistakes during the, the creation and the rollout. And those are two very different topics and and all sorts of mistakes on both sides of it but um the the number one mistake that people make when building compensation plans is to make it too complex to to do add too much complexity to the compensation plan you know you said you haven't talked about compensation plans in two and a half years it's such a funny thing because it's that's the reason that salespeople do their jobs is to to make the money to right. make the commission but it's it's such a under understood thing and something that, that doesn't get talked about a ton. And, and so the complexity of it is the, the number one mistake that's, that's made by organizations. Totally makes sense. Cause if you asked me the same question, I'd go, the ones I didn't understand would be my least favorite, yeah. <laughs> my least favorite comp plan. Yeah. Are there any specific, um, examples or maybe like, kind of like, uh, gotchas that can be, you know, that can cause that complexity? Yeah, for sure. And so the the complexity is kind of the the symptom um, of the of the uh, bad comp plan. But what actually causes those bad comp plans generally is when organizations have one person build it or one organization build it um, because there are so many different facets of compensation plans. I always point to revenue operations as the organization that should own compensation planning. And, and that's sure. for a couple of reasons. It's because they, a lot of times they come from a sales background, RevOps. So they, they have that passion for sales, but they also have that, that analytical and, and, you know, nerd brain a lot of the time. Um, I refer to myself as a sales nerd, so it's, it's okay. I can say that. Um, and so that, so if, just the finance organization is responsible for building the comp plan. I say that finance tries to pay salespeople as little as possible and salespeople try to pay salespeople as much as possible. And, right, and RevOps right. is kind of a good a good in, intermediary there. Um, so right. going it alone, trying to build the compensation plan by yourself, a lot of people do that and that's how they get in those, those issues. Okay, so we've got complexity, uh, one person or org building it maybe kind of in a vacuum or by themselves. Is there, is there a third or any other things that our listeners should be out for if they're uh, reevaluating or, or building a new comp plan? 
Yeah, so consistency is a big one. Um, and obviously I could talk for hours, I do uh, every week, talk for hours about the specifics on on each of these mistakes. Um, you know, with the complexity, it's too many accelerator tiers or different floors mm -hmm. or different commission rates for different products or you know, having 12 different ways you can get paid. Um, but yeah. the one that, that is a, a common mistake that I see that is more of a uh, systemic issue is non-parity uh, across compensation plans. Yeah. What I mean by that is different sales reps who are in charge of the same thing getting paid differently. And so this is something that is, I try to shout from the rooftops and, and maybe it comes off as me being on my high horse about, but what often happens is if you have different compensation plans for different people, the people who are paid the most are going to be the white men and what you end up with is a, a disparity there between women and people of color and their counter their white male right. counterparts. And so and obviously nobody does it intentionally. Um, you're not intentionally going out and trying to underpay those those people, but that's that ends up happening. If you and there are a bunch of like Harvard Business Review articles about it and, and places where you can um, look into this and it's true. And so trying to build these standardized compensation plans where everybody is on an equal playing field regardless of when they started or you know how good they are at negotiating or whatnot. And so um, creating levels, creating a clear career trajectory, career path, um, and standardizing it. Wow, that's that's really interesting. I was not expecting that as an answer, but definitely one I'm glad glad to hear. Uh, well, not that is a problem, but you know something that you're you're focused on and, and bringing awareness to. Um, is there some sort of I don't know audit or or like evaluation that that you do, or maybe you kind of consult with folks to do? Like, hey, if you have I don't know what the number is, maybe twenty, fifty, five. Uh, you know, if you have this many reps, you might want to consider you know this this kind of like pay parity exercise. Is there anything like that that you you recommend or, or maybe currently do? Yeah, for sure. So obviously your your first sales rep is going to have a very, very different persona than your 101st sales rep. And I've, I've sure. been there. I was the second sales hire at, a, at my previous organization, um, was one of the first employees at Quota Path. So you're going to have that that disparity because people come in at different levels or people come in at, sure. at, at, with different responsibilities. And so once you hit that like standardized, putting out a account executive uh, job posting, that's when you should standardize that. So I, I tend to see that around five. Um, and then from there, oftentimes people create the levels. So you have your account executive and your senior account executive, or you have right, an right. AE2 and an AE3 or what have you. And so usually I see it around five, but it, it can't hurt to create that structure early on because you can always change it if you need to. That makes total sense. Okay, so we have covered uh, common mistakes, right, and some some how to to solve that. What about the things that people get right? What what makes you makes you excited when you're like, oh, you're doing this in your comp plan? Right on. That's exactly what you should be doing. Yeah, for sure. So um, my rules about comp plans is that they should be simple, logical, and fair. And so those are the three things that when I see a comp plan that's simple, logical, and fair. I've done some some of these comp plan consults, the four hundred consults I've done have lasted 15 minutes because they've laid out their comp plan for me. And I'm like, no, you're good. Like you're good to go. There's no reason I, I don't recommend any changes. Yeah. Uh, and so the, the, the big ones for me are, um, you know, again, simple. You know, I have a, a rule of pizza toppings where if you have more than three different components to your compensation plan, it can get too confusing for folks. Um, and so the, no, the no for, combo for pizza, pizza plans. <laughs> right, exactly. You know, not like if you start adding like 15 different ingredients on a pizza, you you can't taste it and, and you end up having uh, your reps concentrate on the, the most powerful flavor. You know, they, they're concentrating mm -hmm. on the jalapeno peppers. They're not going to, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm up yeah. in Maine and sometimes people put lobster on pizza and like lobster is a very oh. delicate flavor and it's just overwhelmed by all of the other flavors. Yeah, I know it's not, not a <laughs> you saw me grimace. Um, like, I'm trying to, yeah, it's like, I don't even put pineapple on my pizza, and even, but I'll allow it, you know, I'll allow it to happen in front of me. Mm -hmm. If someone was eating lobster on their pizza in front of me, I'd, I'd, it'd be hard for me to keep my mouth closed and not, and not say something. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, so avoiding the lobster on the pizza there, but, um, and then, it, so that's, that's the simple side. The logical side is as a rep, I understand why I'm being paid the way I'm being paid. 
So mm -hmm. a lot of the comp plans that I see, there's a two-year accelerator and a three-year accelerator. Meaning if you sell a two-year deal, you get a higher percentage. Right. As a rep, if you explain that to me, I, I get it. You know, I get, oh right. yeah, the company wants to lock in a longer contract. So therefore we're gonna, we're gonna pay you more for it. Um, and then fair is, is that it's, it's achievable, it's attainable and reps feel like they're getting paid an appropriate rate. Um, if, if the industry yeah. standard is to pay 10% commission and you're only paying 1% commission, well, that doesn't feel super fair unless there's a, a reason, unless there's logical uh, logic behind it because you have a ton, right. a ton of inbound or a bunch of resources. Okay, that makes sense. I'm curious, uh, just because you said, is it is it achievable? Do you have kind of a, a benchmark and an ideal place for like participation rate for teams? Yeah, this is a, a question that comes up a lot. Um, and there are a ton of different ways to go about it. I know that some organizations say that 80% of your reps should hit 80% of their quota or, or higher. Um, I think that's a, a fair one to look at. Um, you definitely want your top performers overachieving your quota. Uh, I'm a big proponent of accelerators. And so you mm -hmm. want your top performers earning uh, a lot there. Um, yeah. I also focus on the the underperformers there. Are the underperformers hitting 20% of quota? That's not great. Um, you know, what, why, why are they only hitting 20% of quota? So trying to keep everybody in that 60 to 150 band there. Um, and yep. I like the idea of at least 80% of reps hitting 80% of quota. I think that's a, a fair assessment there because most that's how most financial models are built. And, and most reps would agree that you know, at least hitting 80% you know, quarter after quarter is, is fair. Nice. Yeah, I, I've heard the the eighty rule. I haven't heard 80, 80, 80 percent of eighty percent of their quota. Just eighty percent at. But that makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, I want to go. I'm going to go backward and then forward. So you'd mentioned kind of like, do I under you know do reps understand why they're being paid this? And that was always my my thing as a sales rep was if the commission you know you get let's say you get your commission check or it hits your bank account right direct transfer or whatever, and it didn't didn't look right. Now if it's if it's too high, you're probably not going to say anything. Uh, but if it looks too low, you know, you're going to probably go do some math and try to figure again. out, hey, is this the right number before you go to, you know, finance, rev ops, whoever, right? And kind of like um, contest it. And so the thing that I always thought about was like what we're ba battling is like information symmetry, which is like, I don't really even understand how this works, but I'm going to make a case to someone who made the framework and the equation, right? And so it doesn't feel... It feels unfair, either purposeful or not, probably not. And so I already feel like I'm kind of uh, at a disadvantage, right? And so I know that's not a good feeling that we want our sales salespeople to have. And so to move forward, my question is like, why is it so important to get comp plans right? Other than kind of like the, the trust, the trust probably is number one, I'm guessing, at least from my experience, but I'm curious, Graham, like what you think there and how you approach that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. And I think that the the transparency is also integral there um, that you're talking about, and and you know that that's without doing a plug of, of my own company that that that's a, a major reason that we exist is that that compensation sure. transparency, understanding exactly why you're being paid on every single deal, and how you're being paid. I mm -hmm. have worked in organizations where people leave because they got mispaid, or they they thought yeah, that they were right. going to get paid ten thousand dollars on a deal and. What happened was they ended up only earning five thousand dollars on that deal, and yep. they hated it, and they quit. And so that is is something to to avoid. It's it's one of the most expensive things you can do is lose a top performer because you underpaid them by five thousand dollars. And so it's that it's right. that transparency. And and you had said you know, mistakes that you that I see during the creation of the compensation plans as well as the rollout of the compensation plans and the rollout and messaging thereof is just as important explaining everything about the compensation plan understanding the extremes pressure testing it why are we paying this way instead of just hey this is this is your compensation plan if your if your compensation yeah. plan is as simple as you earn 10% commission off of everything that's easy to explain but sure. once you start adding in accelerators and decelerators you better have it down pat the messaging around it and you have to have, make sure that your reps understand it clearly as well totally totally no it makes sense i mean yeah. it's important because we're talking about people's livelihood and not just the you know finance you know finances they can bring into their home and pay for their lives but it's also like you know you're putting in blood sweat and tears to win and to accomplish something and so then at the last you know at the 11th hour to get less than you thought you were going to get and not understand why and then sometimes it's really challenging to get that clarity or to make an ex 
an exception or a correction, that can definitely cause uh, a lot of frustration from sales reps, like you said, and and they'll leave. Which which I'm going to use as a segue to the story that I prefaced earlier, because okay. uh, you said you know once upon a time you rolled out a comp plan to your team that caused about half of them to leave the company. So, you know, I want to know what happened, why, and uh, <laughs> what did you learn from that, Graham? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And a lot of that is the the framework that I have for evaluating compensation plans now um, comes from that story. So this was when I worked at a company called Trendkite. It was the, the organization that I was working for prior to Quotapath. I ran the sales development team there. So I had about a 45-person organization. There were four managers and 40 reps underneath me. Um, so the... Edict came down from the sales team, sales leadership, finance, everybody above me that said, we need to stop focusing on quantity and need to start focusing on quality. Because up until that point, my reps were compensated just every meeting you set, you get 50 bucks. Um, and, and that was great, but we had a really broad ICP. And so anybody could buy it. And because of that, it was hard for us to evaluate what was a qualified opportunity or who was just taking a demo just for, for taking a demo's sake to, sure. to get the SDR off their back, yeah. if you will. <laughs> and so we, we said, all right, let's focus on quality. Um, and here's the issue is that issue, mistake number one, I tried to do it by myself. I said, mm -hmm. okay, I'm a director. It was my first time in a director role managing managers. I said, I'm the expert. I have to come up with this by myself. If I ask anybody else, that's a sign of weakness or like that they made a right. mistake. I had just recently moved into this director role. And so I said, all right, I'll build it. And so I, I built this and then didn't run it by anybody. And and without getting into too much of the nuance here, I, I created a an overly complex plan. Um, I said that there were three different types of opportunities that you could create. You could create a, we sold the PR agencies, we sold the brands and we sold the enterprise brands. And Instead of creating some sort of like simple system there, I gave each of those a dollar value um, where I said, okay, an agency is 9,000 and a brand is 24,000 and an enterprise is 44,000. I don't remember the exact numbers there, but sure. I think that actually might be it. Um, and your target is $200,000 worth of qualified revenue. And like I created this structure where reps didn't, didn't really understand it. And I didn't even really understand it either because... Mm -hmm. Now I look back and I'm like, well, they could just go whale hunting. <laughs> All they have to do is set five demos with enterprise right. organizations and they hit their quota or, you know, 50 with uh, of brands and they hit their quota. Yep. And and that that's a miss there. And then um, again, I didn't I, I I'm going to point out all the mistakes here. And, and this is one that I am super not proud of, which is that I didn't create the, the clear gates and the clear expectations around what a qualified opportunity means. There was a an mm -hmm. element of sales rep decision on it. And so some sales reps would qualify, mark their opportunities qualified at a 5% rate, and some would do it at a 90% rate. And the people who would do it at a 90% rate, of course, would get more opportunities from the SDRs because they knew that they yep. would qualify it. And yep. then yep. to make it even worse, the people who identified this and were doing this and giving these opportunities, we had a uh, like a you know, boys club where it was the the men on my team and they had identified this and they were again not intentionally and this wasn't this wasn't done intentionally by me it wasn't done intentionally by them right. but giving these opportunities to the other men on the sales team and so what ended up happening is the women on my team were underperforming and the men on my team were overperforming unnecessarily like like or or right. without merit and so. Right. My reps went from a very clear, easy comp plan to an unfair, complicated, poorly built comp plan. And not only did I did a ton of people quit, we ended up having to pip and fire a few people as well that probably didn't deserve it because mm -hmm. they didn't weren't actually underperformers. They just didn't game the system like everybody else did. Right. Well, it's funny you say game the system, uh, and I appreciate you sharing that, Graham. I know it takes a lot, a lot of vulnerability and honesty to you know own up to a, uh, you know and share that story publicly. But I know you've obviously since learned from it and, and are helping others uh, by sharing it. Um, but that that subjectivity, right, in the gaming the system. Anytime there's a system, or you know humans are incentivized to do something, we are always going to find the easiest and or the fastest way to get to that incentive. And so I know it's kind of like, you know, semi obvious, but when you put you and the general, you put a incentive in front of someone, you have to think of what behavior is that going to start to promote 
based on the fact everyone wants to get paid the most they can doing the least amount of work. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I always encourage comp plan gaming. I'm always like, yeah, go for it. And like, I, when I build a comp plan, you want someone to feel like they're gaming the system, but you want to design it that way. Like, oh yeah, you do get paid 1.5 times as much for closing a two-year deal. What do you yeah. know? Like, oh, and it's not that much harder to close a two-year deal? What do you know? Like, I <laughs> built it this way to encourage yeah. that behavior. And so decide right. what that behavior is and build a, a comp plan that is gameable, but in a way that you want it to be gameable. Like, you want people to do that right. thing. Well, you want it to be mutually beneficial. The thing you're gaming puts money right. in your pocket and makes the company more valuable. So it's, if it's mutually beneficial, yeah, game the system all day long, get paid and everyone's happy. Yeah, absolutely. So we're talking about uh, incentivizing behavior, right? And some of the best, or at least the clearest changes to my comp plan as a rep was, hey, the company's going in this new direction. Maybe it's a new vertical, new uh, region, new product. And for that reason, we're going to make it really, really uh, lucrative for you to go sell in that place, sell that thing, right? So tying comp to a strategic initiative. I'm curious, Graham, if you have any examples, stories, or maybe kind of best practices for folks who uh, are, you know, leaders who want to, you know, incentivize their folks to do some specific type of behavior that impacts the organization. Yeah, absolutely. So, so a couple of thoughts on this. The first thought is, uh, I say that comp should be the caboose, not the engine. You shouldn't drive your your company strategy around compensation. And I do see this pretty regularly, where people will say like. Well, I'll say, you know, are you are you um, closing any two year deals? And they say, well, no, we're not. Uh, you know, would you like to? And they say, yeah, I mean, we'd like to, but we're not paying more for it, and so we're not going to close any two year deals. And I'm like, what? Well, no, don't let the don't let the comp dictate what you're gonna right. what you're gonna do. Like, you can always change the compensation. Focus on the, the the company targets and the company goals and initiatives, and then build the compensation around that. And so, I love that, that you're asking about. How do you how do you modify that? So um, the the short answer is that you can make tweaks to comp temporary tweaks to comp plans, and I see these all the time, and and they're you know, often called spiffs or um, right. short term incentives or quarter long incentives or whatever. And I'm a yeah. big proponent of of using those because it allows you to test things out. It allows you to say, okay, for this quarter, I need you to focus on product A. Um, and then that, that gives us a bunch of data because mm. maybe product A is actually easier to sell. And if it's easier right. to sell, we probably shouldn't pay a higher commission rate on that um, right. unless it's right. way more profitable. You know, you have to balance each right. of these different things. But what, what you're going to want to do is, is get a bunch of data on this. Are reps selling this at 15% commission? They are. Well, is that all they're selling? Yeah. All right. Well, then maybe we need to change that. <laughs> maybe maybe 15 is too high. Maybe we want to drop yeah. it down to 10. And so using those, those short-term incentive plans um and you know, people put a back acronym on spiff to sales performance index fund or sales performance incentive fund or whatever i don't i don't Another believe that I've never but heard um, spelled out i've only heard spiff and never asked that it was <laughs> what the acronym stood for i was like yeah it means, it means money i think it's a back acronym <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly exactly yeah yeah and so i mean i, I think that it, that um doing those short-term things where you say Let's try it out before you roll it out because rolling back yep. a compensation plan change can be incredibly painful. Um, and so you know, maybe it's just for a quarter or maybe it's for the first 10 deals sold or you know, mm. some some sort of metric there. That's really interesting. That is interesting. I'm trying to think, I think maybe once in my career I saw what started as a, sh a short term uh, you know, spiff, like a quarterly thing actually turn into a year long and then one time the same one it was just part of the comp plan. I don't know if it was ever like announced. It just like never went away. Um, but that's interesting, at least in a way, like you said, like, hey, we're specifically going to collect some data on this, try to put money in your pocket in the meantime um, and drive that behavior. That's interesting. Yeah. And and sometimes it's, you know, we, we are having a soft quarter. So anything you can go here, yeah. you get an extra 5% on. Or maybe it's you we uh, want to do a competitive takeout. So we'll give you an extra... 500 bucks for every competitive right. deal you you win. That actually is what it was. It was a competitive, uh, the competitive spiff. And then it was like, yeah, yeah we just kind of kept it. It worked really, really well. And they're like, we'll just keep going. We'll keep going. And it's like still going to this day. 
All right, well, let's let's transition a little bit here because when we were when we were prepping for this, I was curious, you know, how comp plans change, right? So if you've had four hundred consults, I imagine, like you said, probably starting around that five to ten reps, guessing up to a thousand, maybe more. You'll tell me in a second here, but I'm curious. Uh, I'm going to use round numbers because I'm not, uh, you know, a mathematician here. Uh, but how does how does a comp plan or how do you suggest a comp plan changes from like, you know, 10 reps to 100 reps to 1000 reps and feel free to, you know, recorrect those buckets there of how you view it. Yeah, for sure. So um, a lot of it comes down to consistency. You know, the, again, once you hit that 10 reps, you should you should have that consistency when you're at 100 reps, you absolutely need that consistency. Um, and, and the transparency as well. I think that in transparency increases as your, your sales force increases because otherwise you're trying to hide a secret from a thousand people. That's not, not a good idea. And so right. um, creating, um, also creating career paths. So creating the idea of somebody can become an account executive to an account executive too. And here are the, the four things that you need to do. Um, oftentimes what happens when you go from 10 reps to 100, 100 to 1,000 is there's more nuance to the comp plan and they get more and more and more complex. Um, you know, yeah. you, you, it's a good proxy of saying like, however many people are on your sales team is probably how many pages your, your comp plan is. Um, <laughs> and so I see I 30, 40 page comp plans. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And so I, I see like 30, 40 page comp plans. And I'm like, why, why is this so? And it's like, well, we have all of these products we sell or all of this nuance. Our company is, is so, so big, but that right. doesn't have to be the case. Some of the simplest comp plans or the best comp plans I've seen are at those larger organizations. Um, so that's that's the the first thing is don't make it more complex just because you feel like you have to. Um, mm -hmm. And then the second thing is obviously what you end up with are oftentimes higher quota to on target earnings ratios as the organization grows. So what I mean by that is early on you're sub a million dollars, you have two salespeople maybe your reps are making $150,000 a year, their quota may only be three times their, their on target earnings. Um, mm -hmm. Then that's because they don't have the marketing resources, they don't have the management, they don't have the, the enablement, the rev ops, the tools, um, all of those kinds of things. And so as you scale, those multipliers tend to go up. And mm -hmm. yes, it's true that, that quotas always increase. It's like, well, obviously the quota next year is gonna be higher than this year. Again, this comes down to messaging on somebody is like, we have to explain to the team why their quota is increasing. Yeah. It, it has to be like, yes, your quota is going from a 3x to a 4x. Here's why. We've invested in additional product, additional marketing, additional enablement. And because of that, our customer acquisition cost is going up. And because of that, we commissions are often pay, often one of the highest things that you pay out on a deal, yeah. um, you know, behind maybe marketing or, or what and support. but. The commissions are one of the highest things, individual rep commissions. And so those gradually inch down as you as you grow as well. You, you know what's interesting, Graham? I was going to ask if you have a talk track, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll not put you on the hot seat. I think that did a good job. I was in sales for six years and never had anyone explain that to me the way you just did. Not even at a high level. It was quotas go like it wasn't this blunt. But what you hear is quotas go up. What are you going to do about it? Like that's the way of the world, right? Like, you know. Can't, uh, can't can't avoid taxes. Can't avoid your commission going down or your or your quota going up. Um, so that's yeah. that's that's great to hear. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to put you on the hot seat here for a second because there's one question that came up during our conversation that I didn't prep you for. So I hope it's okay. Um, but I keep right. going back to like you, for, you do 400 of anything and you're going to get some cool learnings and experiences. I'm curious, Graham, if there's one thing that jumped out is like the most surprising thing. Like, as you're doing all these consults, was there one surprising thing you heard, learned, said? What was it? So I'll give you a, a negative surprising thing that sure, I've heard I'll a it few all. times, um, w which is every once in a while, I have a sales leader or a finance leader say, I don't want my reps to understand how they're being paid. Um, wow. And that is like, I've, nearly hung up on people after that um, yeah. because it, that, that's such a that's such a different viewpoint than I have that if you understand how you're going to get paid then you you will do the things that you want people to do and so uh, or people want you to do and so uh, I think that that was the the worst one I've seen um, 
Another surprising one is that so many comp plans are built with good intentions and then the person who built it leaves and the next person comes in and says, eh, this plan works fine, right? And doesn't really take a look at it and says, okay, great, you know, maybe we'll look at it next year. And then the same thing happens the following year. And then the same thing happens the following year. And so that that's one where I'm like, oftentimes it's like, oh, why is this our comp plan? Because it's always been our comp plan. Um, yeah. versus taking a critical eye and seeing. And, and and the advice that I give, some slightly controversial advice that I often give is discuss the comp plan with your reps as you're building it. Like, what oh, do you like about this comp plan? What don't you like about this comp plan? What do you understand? What don't you understand? And, you know, you, you of course, don't want to let reps build their own comp plan, but, I mean, you kind of do. Like, you know, what do they, yeah. what do they focus on? And and where do they feel like they can win? Um, yeah, that was a well, that was another one. Yeah. I like that a lot. Well, and I think too, if you set expectations like, hey, this is not a uh, you know democracy here. We're not you know it's not going to be a voting system for how this thing gets built. But I do value your input and will take it into consideration. I think too, and then closing the loop of you know imagine sharing it with your team. Hey, it's done and we're rolling it out. By the way, Graham, really appreciate that insight you had about X Y Z. We did it. We included that. Hey, Devin. Really like the idea about one, two, three. We didn't end up doing it, and here's why. I feel like that even alone, be like, wow, I'm heard, and this is a team, and we're all here, like building this together, and like you know, really feeling cared for. Um, that'd be a great experience. I'd like that. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, and and as I said, that um, you know, you don't want your reps to to build their own comp plans. I've actually that, that reminded me of one situation that I've seen <laughs> where they let people build their own comp plans, and what I mean by that is they let you come in and say whatever on target earnings you want. Um, and so, you know, and, and there was ranges, you know, it's like anywhere from 120 to $300,000, you know, is, is your on target earnings. And you get half of that as a base salary. And the other wow. half is, is your variable. And your quota is five times that. So you can say like, oh, I want my, I want my on target earnings to be $200,000. And Great. Here's a hundred thousand dollar base salary for you. Hundred thousand dollars available, but your quota is a million dollars. You're gonna earn ten percent of of everything you sell, and then they set up these like, but here's the minimum bar. If you if you don't hit seventy percent of your target, then you're going to be put on a performance plan, and mm-hmm. then if you don't hit seventy percent again, you're gonna be put on a final, you know, and then you're gonna get fired. And so it created this structure of like people knew what they were capable of, and they were able to set their own compensation plan but it was all structured and standardized and and you could change it once a year or whatever but um, did it i thought work that was out? a really cool model did it work like did was it they continued to do it they continued to do it wow they continued to do it and i think that i think that what it was is that for the first like six months you were on the standard plan and then afterwards you were allowed to That's to fair. do that and and so it was like you have to prove yourself out a little bit and then you have to <laughs> and then you can you can decide you know oh i want to stay where i am or i want to be i want to be a top performer i want to hit 150 percent because but you know i miss out on the base salary because i i earned less because i chose a, a higher quota. yeah that is very interesting. I was I was committed that you were going to tell me it was a circus and they like <laughs> drew it back. Like you're like, yeah, we talked and they're not doing that because that's insane. Uh, yeah. But the hearing that it worked, you know, and challenging conventional wisdom, that's that's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I think Graham, it takes a, a right sales culture, the right sales culture for that. For sure. For sure. Um, all right, Graham, I'm going to hit you with the last final question and the one I also didn't put on the uh, the docket here, but it's not too hard. We ask all of our guests the same question to wrap up the conversation, which is how would you describe sales in one word? Hmm. Imperative. Oh, that is a first. And I was kind of, I was, I was a little right. I was leaning toward this guy might say commission, uh, but what, why imperative? <laughs> I think it's, it's just an imperative thing to the, to, to get right within a sales organization or, or within a company. You know, the, the sales team tends to be the lifeblood of a, uh, of a company and without the sales, the company doesn't exist. And, you know, yeah, the, getting the, the compensation is imperative. It's, it's getting the compensation is, is required for for the sales team to be happy. You need your salespeople to be happy to sell. You need your, your sales team to sell to, to continue to exist as a company. 
I like it. Graham, I like you. I like what you're up to. And I like what Codapath is doing for sales folks and revenue leaders. So thank you truly for hanging out and uh, sharing your wisdom and expertise with us. Yeah, happy to be here. Thanks for having me, Devin. 